So this panel is going to look to try to explore the intersection between um, grassroots activism and, and policy making. Um, and so we're lucky to be joined by four people who have done a lot of really great work um, in, at this intersection. Um, so I'm going to first just introduce each of them uh, quickly and then let them talk a little bit more about their own work. Um, I'll ask a couple of follow-up questions and then we'll open it up for the rest of the audience for Q&A. So, first we have uh, Laura Esquivid, who is a longtime political strategist and advocate for social justice issues. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, including the LGBT, Latino, and labor movements. She is the principal of uh, Esquivid Consulting, where she develops and delivers strategy, outreach, and communication plans for political campaigns and progressive issues. Um, she's also served um, as the Senior Vice President of Political Affairs at the Gay and Lesbian Victory Fund, um, and is the Director of Issues Marketing for People for the American Way. She holds a Master's Degree in Political Science and is currently a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. Um, next we have Gunnar Scott, who is a founding member of the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition and currently serves as the Executive Director. He's been involved with the transgender rights movement since 1998, and he's a nationally recognized act uh, activist, educator, and community organizer on LGBT health issues, um, LGBT partner abuse, and addressing access issues for the transgender community. Um, next, we have Amber Holaba, uh, who is a founding member of Queers for Economic Justice based in New York City, um, and she's currently serving as the interim executive director. She's a well-known activist, artist, public intellectual, and community organizer. Um, she's worked for um, a bunch of different organizations, including Elder and LBTI uh, Women's Services and Howard Brown Health Center in Chicago, um, a senior strategist at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, and uh, with SAGE, which is Services and Advocacy for GLBT Elders, um, as well as the Gay Men's Health Crisis. Um, and last, we have uh, Mayor, <clears throat> Mayor uh, Kenneth Reeves, who served as the Mayor of Cambridge from 1992 to 1995, and again from 2006 to 2007, and is uh, currently a council member. Um, he was the first African-American mayor in Massachusetts and the first openly gay African-American mayor in the United States. He's a graduate of Harvard College and University of Michigan Law School. Uh, so please join me in welcoming um, all these great people. So um, a lot of really great, interesting work has been done by the people at this table. Um, so I, I want to first give each of you a chance to kind of introduce some of the work that you've done, but um, also uh, within the framework of um, addressing some of the issues that are commonly left out of the mainstream LGBT movement. Um, so <laughs> each of you guys have done work of, you know, affecting trans folks, youth, the elderly, and issues uh, touching a range of social and economic justice issues. Um, so if you could just introduce yourselves and your work and talk a little bit about um, you know, what, what issues you think are most left out of the movement right now and uh, how that is impacting the broader movement generally. So we'll just go straight down. Sure. Okay. We'll start with you, Mayor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can blame Laura. I was just getting ready to listen. Sorry. Um, can we move on? Oh, try. There we go. Okay, you got it. Let's go. Um, I'll try to be brief, but when you've been mayor three times, how? Uh. <laughs> okay. Um, the work I've been able to do is really, you know, this is the People's Republic of Cambridge, which is a <laughs> somewhat zany place. And, for example, we, this is the only city I know that has had a black lesbian mayor. So, mm -hmm. so uh, it's difficult to be different here. And we go to, uh, <laughs> this is the place, first place in the United States of America which accepted uh, legal marriage intentions in the history of the country in our Cambridge City Hall. So. We feel we're sort of on the edge, as it were. Uh, so just assume that that took a lot of work and it was a lot of fun, and um, we wish everybody else in the country and the world had it like we kind of have it here. The thing I would like to spend a minute on, though, about the, the, the things that are left out, and I really encourage you to do something I did this morning, which uh, I am an absolute Irvishy groupie. And I happened to read something she, paper she delivered at CLAGS in November of last year. Yes, and this has to do with the browning of America, so, uh, of, of, of the movement. And if you don't know Irvishy, she really is profound, and she's on the next panel, so you want to stay for her. Um, she really talked a lot about how the gay and lesbian movement, as it is in the U.S., is really a very white movement, uh, both structurally and intellectually, based on who the 
participants have been and who the money has been and how the issues have been chosen and that there is this wonderment if, if marriage is uh, is equal everywhere will the movement be over and and there is this question also about what about you know the poor people and if one in three black men in America is involved in the criminal justice system in some way, and this achievement gap, which largely is people by people of color, and uh, these surveys of black LGBT opinion, which are completely unrelated to priorities and questions that are in the broad mainstream of this movement. And so she sort of suggested the movement might take a pause now and consider these questions for real. Uh, why is the leadership structure so dominated by certain people in, in the absence of some certain people, not all of whom I just mean people of color, but the whole blue collar working class white people, they didn't seem to get chosen. Or, I mean, they didn't uh, seem to participate. And maybe the movement that we have had and it's a good movement. I'm, I'm, I used to be involved very much with uh, the Black Lesbian and Gay Leadership Forum, which is something I should have put here, which is a very seminal organization. And there was also an organization for Latinos, nationally called Gay Go, that uh, t attempted to be a partner and part of the discussion, but both for financial reasons sort of went away. And that is very meaningful for me because that was sort of I felt when I had a voice that it was mine and I said what I had to say about the experience that I was having when in mine were having in a way that I knew had to be heard. And so I would just say that I think the the future and some of where we have to go is to be sure the answer to this question isn't that when everybody gets marriage equality, the movement will be over. I used to wonder if all of the people at the HRC dinner who wore a tuxedo and bought a $250 ticket, if somebody said, now all of you are okay, would they just step over the line or would they say, no, we can't go without everybody else? And I do know that there are some horrific things about American society even today and these just statistics I've mentioned about if you were black male and you knew that someone fitting your description uh, had a one in three chance of, of going to jail or, or be heading to jail if you know as I know that the average life expectancy for black men in this country is 58 years old for white women is 78 years old. For white men is 75 years old. For black women, merciful Jesus, is 75 years old too. So what? Well, wouldn't a caring country want to know if that gap could be addressed? I, the America I'm in should be. I'm certainly worried about it, and I'm an American. I happen to be also a black male, but I want you to worry about it too, because I would be worried if you were in this trouble. And so it's the making sure our movement is our movement and that it is concerned about the very important questions of the day here. Uh, because um, it's not sure. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um. It's not an accident that I'm the um, director or interim director of Careers for Economic Justice, um, and that those the issues of economic justice, of um, social justice, have been the critical piece in my own queer identity, in the way that I understand social activism, um, and the way that I think about the conversations and the limits of the conversations in many of the places that I find myself. Um, and today it's been interesting to be a part of this because I feel like I'm kind of, I feel like there are two movements, one that's here and one that's not. Um, the movement that's here and which has done extraordinary work is a movement for equality. 
is a movement that has really fought for, for a kind of equal justice issues, for issues that are framed in the context of don't ask, don't tell, and, uh, uh, and marriage equality. But the movement that I have been a part of and that I um, feel is, is often not at the same tables um, some of the movement that you're talking about, Irvishi having spoken about in terms of kind of who's representative and who gets left out, but it is a movement that, um, that would prioritize the queer context of poverty, of being in two wars, of an aging demographic that's explosive in this country and uh, this country is incapable of dealing with about attacks on public sector workers and what's happening in this country, about HIV and AIDS, um, for gay men of color, for um, older Americans, the fastest demographic after gay men of color is people 50 and above, about racial justice issues, about racism and tax against people of color communities, about immigration, about right-wing attacks against undocumented and um, immigrant um, communities, global economies, and capitalism, um, queer people and morality campaigns, the way that sexuality and sexual minority status is manipulated by the right to terrify people and attack us in our circumstances, issues of women's reproductive justice and health and the right to abortion. For me, those are the issues that I would consider critical to the formation of a queer agenda. That to me, and the, uh, the questions that those issues raise, questions of gender and sexual orientation in the context of class, race, poverty, discrimination, aging, etc., are the framing of the, of the movement I want to create and the work that I've done. And it is not to say that equality work has not actually had enormous impact over the last 30 years, or to in any way displace it, but it is to really ask another set of questions, which is, what table am I at? Do I want to be equal at an unequal table? Or do I want to change the way the table is structured in the first place? What vision do I have for the work that I do? Is it vision that means that equality is enough for myself? Or is it liberation and social justice that frames the way that I then ask very practical questions? And I want that bigger vision. I actually want a transformed world in which queerness is a part of the mix of what's happening in that world. But I want a world where the question of profit over person is considered a valuable and necessary question to everything else as I'm having that conversation, where it is not acceptable to have people incarcerated in the way that we do in this country, people targeted because of the way that they live their lives, because of their age, either young and old, because of all the kinds of justice issues that I think are fundamental. Um, so when I come to this conversation, I feel from the left, which is definitely where I start, um, I'm a child of the 60s and the 70s. I came out of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Civil Rights Movement. That was the place that framed the way that I saw the world. Um, and I don't think that that is necessarily um, a place that also doesn't mean that you're very practical in what you understand and what you do. But for example, in my advocacy work, I work around folks that are queer and in shelters and homeless in New York City and fight for things like discrimination policies around violence in shelter settings that are uh, targeting people around sexual orientation and gender identity. That's a very different agenda than most of the places that I find in my own movement who are, do not articulate shelter settings, homeless settings, and poverty as a queer issue. Those are the kinds of things that I think are often absent when we're talking about the kinds of movements that we're a part of. And it's the framework that I bring to this panel um, that I would love to have more discussion about because I don't think it's either or. I don't think it's a, a question of not doing the things that, we've, that we're doing now or have done in the past. The question is what the end is 
that, we, that we're fighting to succeed around. Whether or not having a place like Cambridge in absence of all the other places that represent a place like Cambridge. Um, and it used to be in the 70s, a place like Berkeley. <laughs> Which, you know, you'd think, uh, where am I? Um, and sometimes I feel like that about New York, um, frankly. Um, how it is that we're building social justice, how it is that we're building a queer movement, who's in power in those movements, who's funded in those movements, who can afford to speak in those movements, whose voices are not heard because they have no access. It is not an ability to articulate it, but whether or not they're even invited in the first place, and whether or not the kinds of frameworks that we use to identify the priority of our issues uses the question of the extraordinary um, movement that's been created in the last 30 years and, and its limits, um, and whether or not we want to explore social justice and activism in a way that isn't simply represented in legislative achievement, but is talking about a kind of social change, which is an engagement around many issues around racism, around class, around poverty, around incarceration that assumes we're queer in those sites, does not assume that we're somehow an organization that goes to form a coalition outside ourselves in terms of representing those issues. If we're talking about that kind of movement, if we're talking about that kind of agenda, if we're talking about that kind of advocacy, it changes, I think, and expands the possibility for the queer expression of social justice and social possibility. And that's the engagement that I hope we'll have a conversation about today, not because I think they compete, but because they ask a different set of questions and lead in different directions if they're not integrated in each other. Oh, I hate going after Amber. <laughs> And this is the person who does trans work here in Massachusetts. Um, so I, I want to I, I like to tell stories because I think that's really what helps educate people. Um, for folks who know me from Boston, I ran an open mic for nine years called Gender Crash. And I started it because I went to, uh, I really was into poetry slams, and I went to those spaces. And a lot of them were very straight. And then there'd be like one or two lesbian or gay folks who would brave themselves to get up there and talk about queer stuff. And, and um, at the time, I was partnered with a trans woman who was a poet, and there was no space for her. And I was like, well, let's just start something. Um, and you would think it would be easy, but we couldn't even find a location that would host us. Um, that we kept going to different places that we thought were like social justice or you know welcoming or whatever it might be. And at the end of the day, the thing that freaked them out was bathrooms. I feel like my whole, uh, I'm going to, my, my tombstone will be a porta potty. Because uh, that's all I talk about. I've read Plumbing Code, it's very boring. Um, but I think, you know, it really comes down to for trans folks and for folks who are dealing with visible difference. And that's, it's visible versus invisible. Um, you know, I'm at this point in my own transition where I'm pretty invisible, um, unless I say otherwise. There was a long period of time as a gender care person that I was very visibly different as gen in my gender. Um, and I had to make a choice to do activism in a way that I thought would be helpful for the larger community and basically look a little bit more straight, put on a few more ties, um, and act a certain way and talk a certain way and get a certain degree um, to be able to advocate for a community that is significantly discriminated against, that is significantly dealing with poverty issues. When I think about the work that I do through MTPC, it's about economic justice work. And I know that we are, when we're working on legislation, we're framing on equality work. But that's, at the end of the day, we're about economic justice, because that's what our community members are dealing with. Um, and I wouldn't say that we're part of the mainstream LGB. The T is not mainstream. Um, we are being smashed into one or two boxes. I mean, when it comes down to actually doing political work, that's what we get, male or female. Um, and it comes down to which bathroom or locker room are you using, and do you have the right parts to be in there, 
And I'm assuming you have the right parts because you look a certain way and you pass a certain way. Um, and so this work is really about helping folks in my community articulate about economic issues and poverty and the ways of discrimination just tear someone down and tear them apart. It's really about being a human being. At the end of the day, I feel like I'm advocating to people to say, we're human beings and we shouldn't be killed. I'm begging people not to kill us. I mean, I think that that, you know, uh, we're working on a state bill here in Massachusetts, which has been going on for way longer than it should. Um, I'm tired. The folks who are working on it are tired. <laughs> you know, we're going to keep doing it. Um, my joke at the state house is if you're sick of me, just pass the bill and I'll stop coming around. Um, you know, well, that's probably not true, but, you know, at least, you know, at the end of the day, like, I was being interviewed by a reporter uh, about a case in Chelsea with a trans woman who was violently beaten on the street and broad, broad daylight. You know, nobody helped her. Um, and the reporter, you know, did the interview with me and he looks at me and he goes, you're a lot different than the other, you know, lobbyist groups that go up there. He goes, because you not only have to go up and lobby, but you actually have to also help the person that dealt with the discrimination. And you're, you're, you're multitasking all of these things. And it's true, we're juggling all kinds of balls. Um, and they're not always standing up in the air. I was at an international trans conference last year, and um, it was the first time the U.S. was invited. So I was one of five delegates, and I was pretty excited to be with 250 trans activists from around the world. I met trans folks from China and Serbia and places that I was like, I can't even believe that you transition. Like, I can't even believe people transition in the U.S., let alone in countries that we think are so repressive. Um, and the things I walked away with was one, that the level of violence and economic impact for the trans community globally is the same across the board. The difference here in the U.S. is that we don't have state-sanctioned violence, although we know plenty of police and folks that hold power that do commit violence against us. Um, the other thing I learned was that only 1% of the funding, phil philanthropic funding, goes to LGB, LGB movements. And I would say 0 0.00001 maybe goes to trans work. There's a, maybe five of us that actually get funding to do this work in this whole country. I you know, have started a coordination of uh, state level trans political groups around the country and there's about you know, 20 of us and most people it's volunteering and doing what they can and speaking engagements and, um, and some of them can't even get a $3,000 grant just to pay for some materials. <coughs> So when I'm up at the state house and we have our lobby days for the trans bill, you know, I get so excited when we get 300 people out. And I tell my folks in Tennessee, my friend Marissa, who, who runs the Tennessee Transgender Political Coalition, and she can't believe that we have 300 people that come out for our lobby day, because she gets 75. And that's with the GLB folks. And then the legislators say to me, well, 300 is nothing, because when you were doing marriage, you had thousands of people here. So we have been left behind. I mean, that's, there's a whole history of that. I, I, um, my whole 300-page thesis, which I talked about last year, was all about how trans people have been left behind from Stonewall. Um, and that our, our work in the movement, the larger LGB movement, has been completely erased. That the folks that were part of Stonewall and the, and the organizations after that were called drag queens. And many of them did not identify that way. They identified, as we know today, as trans. So the intersections of policy and politics and activism is, you know, it's fighting for our lives. And that some of us have the privilege, and I consider a privilege to be out as a trans person, because I worked at a queer organization when I started my transition. I was supported there. Um, I have friends and family around me who support me. And I'm lucky enough to be getting paid to do this work because at, you know, what ended up happening for us is that someone was going to lose their job when we were starting to work on the bill because we spent all our time on it. And so it became, that became the choice of do we, do we try to raise the money so someone doesn't get fired and we have another person that's employed or do we move forward and do this work? So the movement, you know, I don't think of it as, you know, I think of our work, trans work, as parallel movements that there are many of us that are part of the LGB movement. My queer activism came out of that. I was part of the Lesbian Avengers. I did direct action. I did that kind of stuff. And then my identity started 
to be, I was in a place that I could start to identify as trans and be living as that. Um, but, you know, some of our strongest allies are not LGB folks. Some of our strongest allies are doing immigration work. They're doing anti-poverty work. Um, that, and oftentimes I go into a room and it'll be, you know, majority of straight folks that are doing that kind of work. Yeah, and they are like, they're a little weirded out, but they're like, all right, you're at the table, let's go. And, you know, can you, what, can you give me a little trans 101 and that's fine. Whereas the LGBT community, I feel like I have to fight and fight and fight and justify and, you know, and say, oh, by the way, also I'm queer, you know, and I know that, you know, you get to be one thing. And that's what I think this movement has also done to some of us is that we only get to be one thing. And um, I'll leave you with this last story, which I think kind of encapsulates my work, um, because prior to this I did LGBT partner abuse work, which nobody wants to talk about. Um, and I got an email from someone um, in Texas, a trans activist, and he said, I'm looking for some assistance, my friend is in jail, um, and this is the situation. He was partnered, uh, as a trans man, partnered with a woman, and there was a domestic violence situation, and um, his lawyer said to him, well, because you're the male presenting person, you should, you know, you're going to get, you might as well just cop to it, because you're going to get it anyways. So he said, okay, he thought he was going to get a plea deal. There was a, an alt, a physical altercation where the female partner had assaulted him, but, you know, he thought, you know, I, got, I was one who got arrested because I'm ma masculine looking. He got 40 years. 40 years. He's in a women's prison. They've stopped his hormones. They won't, they made him grow his hair out. I'm just appalled. And they, ha and so here I am in the state organization in Massachusetts getting this email and the person's like, I know you don't, you're not in Texas, but I have tried this national organization, that national, you know, national LGB, I'm not going to name them all because I'm going to send them angry letters next week. Um, but the fact was is that you're like my last hope. I don't know what to do. And I'm just appalled that he's got 40 years and, and let alone all the other stuff. Um, and so I'm like, okay, let's, let's, work on the, let's work on the domestic violence part. Because we can, at least I know I have organizations that do social justice work that get the interconnections of oppression and can at least try to go that way. And where are the LGBT, I call them small T organizations? Where are they? I feel like they've written this person off because they're trans, they're in the South, they're in, they're in prison, <laughs> they're in, they were in a domestic violence situation, and those are all the things that we wanna, don't want to talk about. Um, when I'm, uh, I'm a part of the Equality Federation, which is the statewide uh, organization of state LGBT groups, and I get to hang out with folks from Oklahoma and Tennessee, and you know those LGBT groups will be like, Gunner, you know the national groups have written us off because they don't think that we're going to get anything done in Oklahoma. So money doesn't flow here, resources don't flow here, and it's parallel with the trans community. And I think that you know we the folks on the ground need to be a lot louder about where is our movement going, who controls it, how does the money happen, where do the resources go, and take, and take it back. And I mean, that's what we need to do, is we need to take it back. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I have something in my eye, so if you think I'm winking at you, <laughs> um, I, I could be, but probably it's because I've got this thing in my eye that I can't get out. So it, it sounds like we're all kind of on, this, on the same, uh, playing the same song. Yeah, that's, yeah. Panel of otherness. Yeah, and, and, and I, I hadn't expected that because those aren't usually the kind of gay panels I'm on, right? That's not, um, so wow. Uh, well, what do I think is not is being left out of the table? Uh, you, you know, something that Ken said um, earlier, quoting Irv, uh, about it, when marriage is over. Irv, you just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you are, hi. We were trying to make a Kessler lecture. Anyway, so the quote was, or the, was, uh, uh, or, or the question was wondering if, you know, when, when, you know, we achieve marriage equality, will the movement be over? I had not, never thought of that before. You know, I mean, my work has been all about how we uh, um, leveraging our work 
you know, to for the same the same reasons, um, you know, with these these other uh, other communities that aren't other communities for some of us. Um, and you know, I've seen a lot of progress uh, over my. When Amber said 30 years, I had to do the math. I've only been doing this 27 years. <laughs> I'm the eldest. <laughs> um, but I've been out 38 years. That number is even more shocking. Um, so, so I've been doing this a long time, and believe me, things have really changed. And I, I don't even need to um, make a conscious effort to remind myself of that. I mean, I see it. I see it everywhere. Um, and so I don't want to, you know. Uh, well, I did spend a lot of years saying, you know, we're the fucking gays, but so I don't want to do that anymore because because there is there is movement, you know, like Gunnar said, you know, there are immigration folks and there are, uh, you know, the last ten years, I guess, I've been working on that issue, trying to get uh, immigrant advocates and LGBT um, uh, advocates to work together and trying to figure out the strategies and the messages and um, to make that happen, and it, and it is happening. Um, but what I see uh, is that it's happening more from the other direction. Um, okay, so I don't need to give you examples. <laughs> uh, well, it, it's, I mean, I see some real concrete things happening from the other direction. You know, when, when I started doing this uh, work that long ago, uh, you know, I was, I was much younger. And it was a time where people were still kind of thrown with, you know, I'm, I'm gay, and what does that mean? You know, so, you, you know, it was an identity thing for me, because I'm gay and I'm, and I'm a Latina. And so, which community do I belong in? You know, in the, in the, it wasn't the LGBT community, it was the gay community back then. Um, you know, the gay community, there weren't any women, much less, uh, and there weren't any Latinos. Um, and in the Latino community, you know, there wasn't at that time, you know, m much support or visibility anyway. There always has been in private support for families and stuff. But um, so I, you know, I had to, I had to, for I went through quite a long time trying to decide which one I was going to be and which one I was going to pick. And I had a conversation, and I mean, this is something that I will treasure my whole life. Um, I had a conversation with Cesar Chavez about it because Cesar was the first civil rights leader to come out on LGBT issues. He was at the March on Washington in 1984, I think it was. And I spoke with him about that, um, about the challenge. And I, if I start telling the story, I start crying. So I'm not going to tell the story. But what came out of that was um, starting our own organizations where we could be our whole selves, LGBT Latino organizations. Um, I was a founder of YECO, um, you know, and, and other, many other organizations for gay and lesbian people and, and Latinos because it was the only place where we, um, where we found people willing to work on the issues that affect our lives. Um, all, you know, all of our lives. Uh, and it, it was pretty lonely for a while. Um, but it also gave us a voice and it gave us a seat at the table, you know, because the, uh, the big decision was, well, do we work from within or do we create our own organizations? And I'm a firm believer in creating our own organizations. I have tried working from within and I support people who want to. If they've got the stomach for it, God bless them. You know, I've... I've I did that for a long time, and I find it's it's very slow. It's very slow progress, like knocking your head against the against the wall. Um, and so, for me, you know, having a seat at the table, representing an organization, being you know, there's a gathering of national Latino organizations. Well, I can be there because of you go um, until it's defunct. I don't think there's a single national uh, gay organization of color right now. Um, so the Oh, yeah, yeah, NBC, yeah, right. Um, so, <laughs> so what I, you know, when, when people ask me that, well, so what should we do? Should we start our own organization? You know, I think if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu. So <laughs> it's important to me that we be at the table. Um, 
I think that's that's it for now. You can start with that. I'll, I'll end on that. <laughs> I want to be on that. On the panel that names itself. You're not on the menu. You're not on the menu. Exactly. So you've each kind of touched on a couple of different issues that are commonly left out of the mainstream movement. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested now in some of your thoughts as to how we can better incorporate them into the broader movement, um, if you think it's possible, if you don't think it's possible, and some of the strategies you'd suggest for uh, for doing so. Um, it's an open question for what wants to take it. Well, okay, I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> Microphone's right here. Um, I do think it's possible. I, I do think it's possible. Um, but it's, you know, I, I find it very puzzling that people would expect members of other groups to be there on our issues when we're not there on their issues. You know, the, the, the LGBT community can be quite self-righteous. And uh, it just feels very, um, well, first of all, that just feels like a big blind spot to me. I have seen progress. I, I really have, especially um, some small progress on, on immigration issues. Um, but, oh wait, what was I going to say? Be at the table. Ah. I forgot, it just went blank, because I, I went off thinking about all the immigration good gay stuff that's been happening. Let's hear about um, that, an example of something good. Okay, oh, I know what I was saying. <laughs> Is that working, working on other people's, that, that we're not going to work on other people's issues. We expect them to work on ours. You know, one of the things that happens, as I have seen this, this progress come along with other communities, is, you know, they might be there on this issue, but not there on that issue, and we write them off. You know, they're not our friends. They won't stand with us on everything. I mean, it's just, it seems very, uh, very short-sighted to me and not very strategic at all. Um, so some of the good things that have happened, if you want to hear that, I mean, like I said, this stuff has happened uh, the other way around. LULAC, which is the oldest uh, Latino organization in the country, was started, I don't know, World War II, around that, around that time. Um, uh, uh, they have a gay chapter. They're a membership organization. They have chapters all over the country. They have a whole gay chapter, um, you know, and they, uh, uh, when the Federal Marriage Amendment was up, um, they put up a resolution to the whole, uh, at their co convention, to, for LULAC to oppose the Federal Marriage Amendment. Um, NCLR, National Council of La Raza, they've been very slow to warm to this, but they have. Uh, they now do, um, you know, youth convenings of LGBT youth, and they have a lot of open LGBT, um, uh, LGB. Uh, LGB staff. Uh, every Latino organization I can think of has openly LGB staff. Every single one. And some of them are headed by them, like, you know, like the ACLU for one. Um, let's see. Oh, that's not a Latino organization. So, um, I have just run, I've run out of something to say on that. Anyone else? I actually think that there's a lot of extraordinary organizing that's going on that you might not know about that is uh, representative, I think, of some of the most exciting work that's happening around the country. There's organizations like SONG, which is Southerners on New Ground, um, that is um, doing some of the most amazing work in the South that I know of. Um, and there's Project South which I think is an enormously important organization, doing Southern organizing, primarily um, driven with an economic analysis, with an analysis of racism, with a real understanding of rural and, and small town kind of politics, the way that the, kind of they understand the, the regional impact of things like the organizing that's going on around Katrina and in First Nation settings. I mean, there's really amazing work that's happening around the country that's very, very dynamic, and they're not the only ones. Queers for Economic Justice is in a building with FIERCE, which is a POC organization, youth organization, SRLP, which is uh, Sylvia Rivera Law Project, and the Audre Lorde Project. 
Um, and all four of us are working together collaboratively and more and more beginning to do organizing work together to have impact in different kinds of settings and working across different movements and different kind of structures. There's really enormously vibrant things that I think are happening um, in reproductive work that's happening and control of your own body and some of the um, activism around that critical resistance and some of the issues of incarceration and um, impacts on different communities, some of the HIV organizations that are actually doing work at, that, are, that cross communities and cross age groups. I mean, I, I, I don't think that we're at a hopeless moment at all in the way that things are happening. What I think, though, is that we're at a really fundamentally different organizing moment for people that are doing equality work and getting funded through that work and the way grassroots groups can stay alive. And that is, and you were talking about it, Gunnar, and all of us, I think, in reference, we're talking about it, that that is a real challenge. Because having a more radical analysis and trying to have a structure which you can support, an infrastructure you can support to do that work, is very complicated. I've been trying to think about the ways that we could begin to bring the different kinds of queer social justice groups into um, a kind of coalition ourselves to work, to work without being isolated in our own movements. So that it isn't simply a matter of, do I become the one staff person that's a you know, fill-in-the-blank otherness? Or do we try to collectively have impact on the direction of our own movement and the agenda that movement is setting um, as, a, as both members and having autonomous organizational voice. And I think that those are going to be the issues moving forward that we really need to think about because these things that, that we named as absences don't change because of good intentions. They change because you actually do the organizing work to change the way a movement prioritizes how it understands its own agenda. And if you don't change that thinking, then good intent, as my mother used to say, good intentions pave the road to hell. And so what we need to think about is how to expand, challenge, and engage, and protect the places that are vulnerable in our own movements so that we're not isolated by ourselves and burned out in the organizations if we're the individual that's there representing something that isn't a majority kind of understanding in an organization and that isn't completely limited because our organizations, if they're grassroots, are often so underfunded that we don't have a way to have a voice and we don't get invited to the table. And so we don't actually affect the policies that are then moving forward. And that happens again and again and again. And I think we need to be even more kind of structurally smart about choosing where it is that we push and how it is that we collectivize the way that we understand the priorities in our own agendas so that we have more impact because we can't do everything. And so we're going to have to really decide in the next period of time as the recession is even more devastating to grassroots organizations and to all organizations actually, the more mainstream groups are profoundly impacted as well, how we're going to affect the direction of the political movements that we want to have a voice in so that we're not the exception at a table, but we actually are changing the table itself. Okay. Good. Uh, someone said, talk about the good things, so I yeah, want to talk absolutely. about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay. So uh, a good thing is that the second city of Massachusetts is a city called Worcester. And uh, Worcester has recently elected a black gay man as the president of the NAACP. He's an academic in Worcester, which I think that's a good thing. I think the NAACP has been a traditional mainstream black organization uh, founded by a son of here, Clement Morgan, and uh, William Edward Burkhard Du Bois, who also went to Harvard here. It was founded. Uh, before 1910, they had their, I think they just had their big anniversary 
uh, a year or two ago, but it was formed largely because there was so much lynching going on around the country that it was organized around lynching. Um, I'm on the national board of a group called the Center for Community Change, which is a very, uh, I'm on the C4 board, I should say. Uh, this is a our Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Organization that has been doing good work for years, but I, I think extraordinary work uh, around uh, community organizing and around uh, the voice of poor people in elections and around immigration and around uh, health care. We don't do education, unfortunately. We kind of say that somebody else must be great on that, so we'll do these things greatly that we do. I think the, the, the CCC has an annual budget of about $21 million for the C3 and maybe 10 for the C4, and so there's resources in a, in, a, in a wonderful setting in D.C. where it's the smartest people and this board has so many smart people. Tori Osborne is new on the board. Uh, but you go to a board meeting and it's like, where did all these smart people come from? And I, I'm here <laughs> where they're supposed to be smart. But the, the people who are really understanding national policy and impacting it hard and aren't necessarily all that happy at the moment, which is also encouraging because... Uh, they know that uh, we can do better and must do better. So I think those are good. I forgot to tell you what I was telling you that we had a black lesbian mayor. We also have a black, a white gay man mayor now. So we, it's a very gay place. So <laughs> that's a good thing. Uh, and here it's also, uh, the mayor here chairs the school committee, which in many places, if they knew they had a gay person chairing school committee, it was going to have to run. Here it has never been an issue. It, which is a wonderful, good thing. Um, I'd say the next two things are good, but they have bad and good in them. As I told you earlier, I'm a, a urbishy groupie. My other <laughs> thought leader is a guy in Harlem, New York, named Jeff Canada, who has done some marvelous work with this thing called the Harlem Children's Zone, which is actually... Uh, they took a 97 now square block area in, 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 in Washington, in, in New York, in Harlem, and they're trying to be sure that every kid and every family in that setting has the supports necessary and the programs necessary to get them on to college and into career. And it's serious, great work. So they start off with something called a baby college where they take parents of kid, kids zero to three and they teach them all the thing that, things that middle class families know about turning off the television, reading to kids and singing to them and talking to them. And, 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 and I see in that work some of the glimmer of the hope for the future that we can all be equal and go forward together. Because if his work takes nationally, and it has taken here in Cambridge, we now have a baby university, which we run for 16 weeks. And if you come for 15 of those weeks, we put a card in the hat and if you choose your name we pay your rent and everybody comes so we don't have we don't have to pay so many organizers because you know uh, sort of addressing people's needs is a great way to get their attention and every week we give out fifty dollars gift certificates to the gap and whatnot and people want to come to our meeting <laughs> so <laughs> they want to do this thing that's going to help them so Jeff's work is inspiring to me it doesn't have much to do with LGBT <laughs> Except that um, that really isn't the only question in the universe is LGBT. There's a lot else going on in socioeconomics, et cetera, and so on. It's good to see that there are hopeful programs. If this program works, we'll eradicate the achievement gap. We also might not have so much youth violence and crime at the other end if people are doing well in school and enjoying it and are tied to success ideas. Uh, another thought leader of mine is a wonderful guy in L.A. whose name is Phil Wilson, who had something called uh, the Black AIDS Institute. And they just hosted in the Dominican Republic a black gay men's retreat. It's part of the good, but also ugly, because this is kind of the first time the African-American gay and lesbian community has met the Caribbean one in a way as, as equals. So in, in the Caribbean there, I want it to be somewhat international because it's not all about the U.S. But the 
black gay people in the Caribbean and those in this country haven't had much to do with each other. And I have always dreamed, and Irv, you know this, that we would get together and have something uh, useful to do with each other and we could share lessons learned and things of that nature. Now, the last thing I'll say, this is the ugly. Uh, living here in Cambridge is a little like Oz, not the prison, but the other Oz. <laughs> and and um, so here at the Kennedy School and at the law school, uh, a very brilliant professor here, William Julius Wilson, and one at the law school, very brilliant, Charles Ogletree, have both had courses in the last year on the wire. And the why and, and so this being the other Oz, last week I, all the people who were actors in the in the wire were here on a panel for about six hours. A really interesting, exciting thing to say. Now in the wire, this is a good part of the ugly, they had uh, an openly gay black, uh, a lesbian, uh, Timo, Kima was her name, uh, a police officer, and the, the major figure, major drug dealer, Omar, badass as could be, was, had a hot little Latino look. And this kind of missed many people, but for black gay identity, I'm going to say and Latino too, it was, this never happened before this way that the bad black guy was gay and cool <laughs> and could blow you up and, and, and the lesbian was hot and she was all about business and she was a, a, a great husband and all, the, it, was, it was wonderful, wonderful. So that's the, the worst part though, uh, William Julius Wilson, when he did The Wire, he brought the producer and he brought Jeff Canada and the producer says that across this country, we have decided that places like Baltimore and Detroit, which is where I'm from, in the last in 10 years, in this census, Detroit lost 25% of its people. And we're talking about going back to farming in Detroit. That's how bad that is. It's a net outflow of people. And these are all human beings we all should be caring about. Jeff Canada was there to say he thought that the glass was half full. So the work that he's doing in Harlem to try to build a place that nobody thought anybody good could come from to be a better place. So I'm hopeful that Jeff will win and that the wire vision of the future being that there are places that we just don't care about so we'll just let them go kill themselves and the rest of the country will move on. That that will not be the analysis of the real America but uh, my hope is built on dot dot dot. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, that's what I'd say. Great. So, um, so each of you have either worked as a community organizer or an advocacy. Um, so I'm interested to hear um, how you guys feel that this has benefited the LGBT community in the, in the different sectors you, you've worked in. Um, and what are some of the drawbacks to so Like, How has it advanced um, the overall movement and, and what are some of the drawbacks to, um, to grassroots organizing as a strategy? What's the it? What's that? What's the it? I, the it being, you know, advancing rights and the movement for the specific sectors you guys have worked in. Well, I mean, I think grassroots organizing for the trans community is one. Uh, I'll start with. I have a lot of talent that volunteer at MTPC because they're unemployed. I have an amazing website because my chair is a MIT graduate software engineer has made amazing things before she transitioned and then of course can't get a job um, so I think one of the things uh, that is being overlooked um, is the talent that is available because of the unfortunate thing of being discriminated against and being unemployed and not having jobs so uh, grassroots organizing in our community is um, it's a little bit different, I feel like, than when I did grassroots organizing in LGB communities. I mean, it requires us to provide transportation statements to get people places. Like, we have that as a line item in our budget, so that when somebody wants to come in and rally the state house or go somewhere, we, we put that money in there so that our folks can, can be at these things. Um, and it's really being conscious of our folks who are dealing with disability issues. And, um, you know, it's funny is that we, uh, 
we are not, we're not a service organization, although we do act like one sometimes. And I get it, we're getting more and more calls from um, folks who feel marginalized by the LGB orgs, and they're not trans, but they're like, we know you do work. And we know we see you doing stuff, and I have this problem, and I know I'm not trans, but can I call you? Which is great, except that we don't have the resources, but we do it anyways. Um, and it's funny that, that there are folks out there post, and I'm talking about Massachusetts, post-marriage, that don't know what to do with themselves. Because we did all this grassroots organizing around marriage, and now they're like, you know, the message on one side, and I'm not saying this is coming from the organizations here, but, but the larger message is that we're all done. I mean, I think looking at Massachusetts is a good example of that. We know, we, the organizations and the partners I work with, know that we're not done, and there's a lot more work to be done. But the larger messaging machine has not done that. So we have folks that have the skill set, we have folks that need the skill set, um, and don't know where the opportunities lie in. And I mean, I just don't think, for trans folks, we can't do it without doing grassroots organizing. There's just not enough of us. Um, people don't know who we are, and we need to put our stories out there. We need to get folks out in, in front of that. So. The one thing I would actually ta say um, that I think, I think that there's remarkable work that um, is going on um, at a grassroots level that often isn't visible um, outside of the, the sites where it's happening. Um, and I see it really around the country because I travel a lot and, and go to places and, and look for how people are doing things and what people are doing. And I, I actually think activism is very alive in this country. I don't think it's over at all. Um, and I think that there are models that were we able to get the word out about them, people would grab onto and think about doing um, if, we could, if we could spread the word. So one of the things that I've been trying to think about is how to take the kind of advocacy and organizing and policy work that I think is really more um, often very hard to do, but very, very, very impactful in places where we haven't done work, um, how to move that so that people actually know that other people are doing that work in the first place and have models for how to do it. The fact that QEJ does a lot of shelter work and shelter organizing for queer and not gender non-conforming people is a very different kind of work to work in shelters. We have created policies with the Department of Homeless um, <coughs> services in New York City so that they so that folks can identify folks that need to access shelters can identify for themselves their own gender and therefore placement in shelter settings that's fundamentally important and people don't even know that that work has been done and we did the same thing around family policy so that queer folks could stay together as a family unit and identify for themselves how they saw themselves as a family um, and access family shelters, which is really a very different system than being by yourself and trying to go in with your partner and then being separated in gender same shelter set settings where they then kick you out, don't allow you to sleep together. I mean, these are really pragmatic kinds of things that are going on um, around the country. And I'd love us to have a discussion about the kind of advocacy work like that that I think many people are doing and that you were talking about, Kent, that, that actually take risks in settings which are not identified queerly to do work that impacts a very different segment of our own community and therefore, I think, could be used as the way that we partner and are allies with a whole range of different issues that aren't identified queerly. But were we to shape them, they would be very queer. We need to think about what the impact is and where it is we need to go. I mean, just as a story, in New York City, the, anti the LGBT anti-discrimination law, which took years to get passed, identified the different um, departments in the city that that bill would cover, and the folks passing that the queer folks passing that bill didn't identify the Department of Homeless Services as part of the, insti uh, of the agencies that it had to cover. And so we had to go back and fight to get the anti-discrimination law passed by, uh, you know, advocated for uh, with, gay pe with queer people to include the Department of Homeless Services. And I thought 
thought it was kind of a perfect explanation of class and race in our movement around our priorities. How could we lead out the Department of Homeless Services in the way that we were advocating around discrimination? So I think that there are things like that that we could take on as broader kind of policy issues that would really be profound. Um, the need to combine, I think, a conversation around HIV and AIDS um, in, the, in a queer context. What that does around class and race, I think, is profound. The way that you understand gender in that setting, given the impact of HIV and AIDS on communities of color, women, and trans folks, that is a kind of conversation that we need to be having that impacts then all the other kinds of work that we do, and we need those not to be separated movements um, in some of the ways that, by default, it's happened rather than by choice. I mean, I think grassroots or organizing is is critical. Um, you know, I, I I understand, and I'm glad to have seen the profes professionalization of the LGBT <coughs> movement. Um, you know, I think that's really necessary, and I think it was important for us to, uh, you know, to to learn how to do policy advocacy, and again, be at those tables. <coughs> What I don't like seeing is, you know, the grassroots people criticize the professional organizations and the professional organizations ignore the grassroots people, you know, and there's all this judgment about which one. We need it all. There needs to be an inside strategy. There needs to be an outside strategy. I mean, let a million flowers bloom. But if there is no outside strategy, it makes it really hard. And so, you know, in some ways, I think the grassroots piece is, is the more important one. Because policy advocates can be advocating for something, but if there's nobody out there, you know, making making the policy makers uncomfortable or keeping the issue, uh, you know, in people's minds, it's very easy to to ignore it. Um, and uh, so I, I think our grassroots people are, are really undervalued. Well, uh, you know, because of my association with the uh, Center for Community community change, I, I guess I'm, I'm in rooms where the grassroots is focused a lot and, and it's exciting to hear that there are national groups who are really doing great training of young people from colleges and sometimes even high school. So I worry, uh, I probably should worry more about that, but I, I, what I see is very encouraging. I, uh, Tip O'Neill was the Speaker of the House. Yes. and. Uh, he was from Cambridge, and he's quite well known for having said that all politics is local. So I would think that it would make sense to better understand the grassroots in this way. I mean, the demographics of this country have changed dramatically. The demographics of this city have changed dramatically, and as somebody involved in pol politics, I'm all about knowing my constituency. So, And this constituency has really changed. When I came to this, 80% of those people, of people in this city lived in rent control apartments. They were largely white. Uh, they were students or people who had come and stayed. Uh, the demographic has vastly changed. We have no more rent control. The average cost of a house here is $750,000. So we have a whole different crowd of people. And, but luckily we have enough subsidized and uh, uh, medium income housing that we still are a haven for immigrants. So if I go to the high school, we have one high school, the Cambridge Ridge Latin School, and I'm looking for black students. My first go around in my area is in 92, they were African American, Afro Caribbean, largely Trinidadian, Barbadian, Jamaican, then later Haitian, and many from Puerto Rico and El Salvador. If I go now to look at who's in the high school that's black, they are largely Ethiopian, Somalian, Kenyan, um, a lot from Haiti, more now, but made different class from Haiti, more rural as opposed to the bourgeoisie whole elite, which is, is a different deal. In my own neighborhood, if I go to the newspaper and uh, Google the real estate section and Google mid-Cambridge where I live, it tells me that 76% of the people in my neighborhood have lived there five or less years. Which means to me that every time somebody from that neighborhood tells me they're the community group, I know they represent <laughs> <laughs> they represent the 24% that 
but I am the community group for the rest of them because <laughs> so it, it's the, your demographic situation it is is real real important to understand. So the the the, the grassroots understanding uh, you can't just it's not your mother and father's America. It's not even the one that you grew up with. It's it's very important to keep in touch with who we are in these moments. And the last thing I'll say about that, the national conversation too. So at this high school, the one high school, children of color are two-thirds of the students in the school. They're still referred to as the minority. It can't seem to wash the brain of this stuff. You can't be two-thirds and be a minority. It's just not possible. And and we're, we're beginning to understand that not everybody in the country just speaks English. So we're implementing two-way immersion programs in Spanish and in Chinese, and we have one in Portuguese here too. But my point is, in preparation for this next America, or next world, and we do a lot of that here because we're sort of, we have an area here called Kendall Square, and the local um, consulting group was asked to come and tell us what they saw. And they said that we are the most innovative square mile in the universe. So when you're working with it, and that's because of the biotech activity that's here in bioengineering. Um, the future is going to be much different, and what people do for work is going to be much different, and therefore the education that we prepare people with to be able to be competitive in that is going to have to be much different. And it's not a gender issue. This is a, a, a survival issue. And I was one last piece too. We do a lot of work here in men's health. And because who's leading the men's health? Me. Um, I'm not the greatest example of it, but I, somebody has to do the policy yeah. and get the money. And I go to the gym. I just don't get the result. <laughs> um, we have a wonderful group of lot. We we started here. Nobody is interested in black men's health, including black men. But if you go to a fund for black men's health, they, they <laughs> But if you go about men's wellness, you might get to sit down. And so I learned that. And so we have a host of programs here, Fitness Brothers. We have something called Navigated Care, where we get you a doctor, and we go to specialist appointments because the men don't go. And the leadership of this is gay, but I'm sitting in a, uh, 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 I've got a lot of good folks around me that we're doing this together and they're much calmer about sexuality right. and me or it's not a we're doing the work <laughs> it's led by a, a gay person but it just is the work and we know that the battle is hard and we're fighting it to win it so that it's all in there too great well I have plenty more questions but I think we'll stop here and uh, invite the rest of you to join the conversation uh, are there any questions great a question though, because the panel are going through a period of reflection, is to share, I think with Gunnar, um, in Ireland, we had a similar phenomena where civil partnership came in, and I witnessed an amazing conversation where we sat around and decided, was it time for everyone to go home? Have we effectively won the battle? There's formal equality, and now we return back to our maybe larger identity groups that we're more comfortable in or wanted to belong to originally as equals and fight the fight there. Um, class is a much bigger issue than race in, in Ireland, so look at class discrimination. And the sort of the T and the I section turned around and said, but this is proof that you never accepted us as full equals in the first place. You used us to fight your fight and then now you're all going home when we still need you. Now that the LGBT, or sorry, the L and G part of the whole equation are moving into a position of equality and therefore a position of privilege, that we have to reevaluate our victimhood. And do you think we're doing enough to confront our own discrimination against <coughs> other members of what are supposed to be our community? No. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I, I will say that um, I, was, I talked about that open mic I started. I got, um, the most hate mail I got was actually from people claiming to be lesbians. Um, that often, uh, and this has happened quite a bit here in the U.S., and um, that we, we, I've gotten calls from um, trans guys who 
go to a, a, a queer club that's mostly for women, that's how it's billed, and that they get pulled out by a group of women and beat up on the side of the road. This has happened in Boston, it's happened in DC, there's been a couple cases about this. I was cornered in a bathroom and told that I was making all the butchers transition, and um, I actually stopped talking. People would contact me and they'd be like, I want to talk to someone about, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to come out, and I actually stopped doing it for a long time because I got really scared. Um, you know, and it really messed with me. And it, I know other folks that have had similar experiences. And, um, and you know, it's the being at the table type of thing, you know, it's like, um, you know, and I, and I will say, like, you know, marriage equality affects me as well. I'm a queer trans person who's married to someone who is also F to M. And, and our marriage issues are even more complicated because what do you do when someone's changed their gender marker on this thing but the other person hasn't or this person, they were a straight couple and then one transitions. Like, you know, and these are questions. When the marriage stuff started bubbling up, I pointedly sent them out to lots of legal people and said, what are you going to do about trans folks in marriage? And they were like, oh, I don't know. Literally, I don't know. And they, the question still is, I don't know. You know, and so we have, you know, various folks in various ways, married, not married, being challenged around that. Um, and so even when the issues are our are, are issues together as LGBT, they still don't want to deal with them. Um, I know, you know, gender is the thing that most people think is one of those, those static things that shouldn't change. And it, you know, we were, uh, Kara Sephardini's here, is um, in the coalition for the trans work, and we were at a meeting, and someone who has been on a part of our coalition for about three years finally, like, had this epiphany, like, we're totally challenging gender and what it means, and I was like, where have you been? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Glad you caught on. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, the, the other part of that is that, you know, I've also seen the, G and I, the gay and lesbian community frame trans work as like, we're going to be the gender rebels, we're going to mess it all up. And most of my trans folks are like, no way. I want to transition and blend in. And that's also seen, you know, as a bad thing. But really it's not. It's about survival. Um, and so, again, it's about who has the privilege to be out. And I think that in places that are more accepting, we kind of forget about that. And then in other places that aren't so accepting, like, it's really heightened. Um, you know, and, and where, you know, it is a privilege to be out. It is a privilege to be able to talk about that. It's a privilege to be able to walk down the street. It's a privilege to be able to look the way you want to look. It's a privilege to have control of your body. And I think, you know, the reproductive rights movement and the trans movement are very interlocked because it is about, you know, our bodies and what we get to do and what we don't get to do and those types of things. Um, you know, I, I hope that uh, what has happened with... Um, marriage equality being gained in states or countries isn't the direction that we'll go and we'll leave people behind. You know, I look at other countries like Spain that did a lot of their trans work before they did their marriage work. Um, and even though they're really progressive, there's still pockets there that are really difficult. You know, the economic injustice is still really there. And I think that even if we get laws passed, it doesn't, you know, I know passing a law doesn't change anything, doesn't change something on the day to day for trans people. That's a long time coming. Just as we saw with queer folks, you know, it was a long, how many, you know, were we all middle class and upper middle class and all that back in the 70s? Probably not. Yeah, it seems to me like um, the lesbian and gay movement has been, I, I would agree with you, it's like this movement, this is the movement for equality. But when you add in the B and, and the T, that's, I think it's so easy for people to add in those initials without it meaning anything. And what I like is it's really hard to find that there's even a political movement anymore that can be challenged around that and said, wait a minute, we're not LGBT, particularly T. And what does that mean about us? But it's like this, oh, we'll just throw those letters in. It doesn't really mean anything. People don't have to work on themselves. And that, to me, there's a void where people are working on marriage and they're working on, you know, the don't ask, don't tell stuff. And, Pretty mainstream issues, as far as I'm concerned, that don't really affect me. I think I think of them as civil rights issues, which is really important. But you know, if we go beyond that, I just think it's been interesting to see how we've thrown in these letters like alphabet soup, but we really haven't done the work. 
like the work that's been done around in the past and historically around lesbian and gay stuff. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what you all have to say about that or some of you have to say about that. How do we get that to happen? And is it even going to happen among lesbians and gay people or is it just going to happen in the general society? I think that there really is, like, the, the kind of, I'm sitting looking at Robin, um, and, and was thinking about it before, before you were saying what you were saying, thinking that about how bisexuality had not been a part of the conversation on this panel, um, and is often kind of the, an, another one of the disappeared letters in the alphabet, um, and that structurally it's a disappearance. Um, it's not simply, because there's no action that right. engages with those issues. And I think that that's, you know, when, I, when I'm think, trying to think <coughs> about where we need to go as we're moving forward, it's how do we re-engage with issues of gender, really re-engage with issues of gender. I think that there, was an, uh, there, there has been extraordinary work, and it has huge gaps, and it's still an engaged and unresolved issue, set of issues. And it, sexual desire, the erotic, and sexualities, sexual minority identities, the possibility of engaging in conversation about bisexual identities, transgender identities, lesbian, gay identities, fluid identities, identities and possibilities for the erotic, um, is a conversation we almost never had anymore. And I think it becomes even more difficult as you're normalizing a movement. Um, as you're becoming more and more like everybody else, if that's the end result, then it's hard to be different than everybody else at the same time. Which is eventually... Which it, it, so it's a problem. I mean, it's really a problem that the movement has to engage with. Nobody is particularly responsible for that. We are all responsible for, the, for making sure that those are the conversations that we're having. That gender isn't settled. That sexual identity isn't assumed to be lesbian and gay. That bisexuality and the kind of profound issues that come that that are framed around bisexuality is really a discussed issue rather than a, an initial that's getting gets included or it doesn't that the kind of queer people we're talking about the diversity of queer people within identities is also really represented so that queerness doesn't become by default white and male I mean all of these are the issues that are still in our a, that need to still be the engaging issues in the agenda because they also are the markers for what we choose to do or don't, don't do in our organizations. And if we want those things to be living, then we have to bring them up as living issues, not as though somehow the initials frame the result, because they don't. And any of us that have been around for a really long time, which I have been around for a really long time, um, know what it's like <coughs> to be um, symbolically represented without voice. And the fact that we've now done so much <coughs> to change things is only an added reason to do the work we really need, need to do in order to create the movement that actually includes us in real terms, not in symbolic terms. And I see Rob sitting there, and I know, so I want, I want to throw it to you, too, because I think you have something to add there. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've been sitting here with, with uh, my pulse racing for most of the panel, and not in a very good way. Um, I find it very challenging often to hear LGB used as the, like, the, the place of great privilege, as though these were actually right. fully included in that. Right in that equation, because I think that there's been recent study, there have been recent studies that have shown that bisexual people are not doing well in terms of risk behaviors, right. in terms of health outcomes, and I think there's a very powerful social stress that happens around having identity where there's no place that is home, mm -hmm. where there's no place where you can go and feel that your whole self is welcome. Um, I'm also thinking about the fact that um, bi and trans identities in particular, and queer identities are often pushed to the side because we complicate the simple equation of you know this nice group of people who are just like everybody else and just want the same equal rights as everyone else and that trans people get pushed to the side all the time because it's messy, right? It's not tidy and bisexual people as well. And I guess my question I have a question about the panel. Oh. 
But I do need to say that I've been sitting here like, mm. And by the way, there's not a single bisexual organization in the country that has any paid staff people. So, and my, I guess my question is related to that. Yes, yeah, sucks, doesn't it? <laughs> um, my, my question is related to that. I guess as people, each, each panelist is representing some sort of identity or community or movement that is marginalized within the larger um, lesbian and gay mm -hmm. community. I guess my question for you is what, I mean, there, there are some people who could give it, who, who, who could care less, right? And, but there are also people who do care, but whose energies are focused elsewhere. Um, I guess my question is like, what are your asks? What specifically can people do to support the important work that you're doing? Because every single panelist, you know, each of you has mentioned things that are are critical. So I guess my question is, you know, Amber, can Laura Gunner, what can what, what what are your asks of people who do care, who are not necessarily going to come out and work for your organizations full time? What else can people do to support you? Well, I've got a couple of things. I have a reaction to the last question too. <coughs> My first one was, well, at least you've got the initials there. You know, because we're, when we say our community, you know, my community includes people who aren't even a part of, who aren't even, you know, nominally, politically correctly acknowledged to exist. Um, and, you know, the, it, and when, we, when I started doing the, you know, immigration work and looking for the opportunities to bring LGBT organizations um, and Latino organizations together, uh, it, it wasn't that hard on the Latino side. I mean, it was initially, but it, it was framed in terms of uh, uh, discrimination, right? And so Latinos understand that. And so, you know, we got members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus to write a letter to George Bush opposing the federal marriage amendment. Um, you know, and Maldiv to take a position, and, Mald and, the, and the gay community was upset with me because I didn't get them to support marriage. It's like, I'm not going to ask them to support marriage. I mean, I want them to, you know, to oppose this thing. And, the, and there has been a lot of, lot of movement since then. Um, but I think it, but, but going to the, the gay organizations, you know, the, the, when they started maybe mentioning immigration or putting it on the agenda, even at People for the American Way, which is a very, you know, progressive, white, liberal, good organization. And when they started taking on immigration issues, there was a lot of pushback from members. Right? I mean, we can't, I don't, I don't assume that the gay community understands discrimination in the same way and that they feel, you know, like there should be comprehensive immigration reform. So the same thing with the, so, so with the B and the T and the Latinos, I mean, I think that the gay community is conflicted about really how do they feel about these groups. You know, I mean, because, but be honest, if the letters weren't there, we'd be raising hell too. So the, so the letters are there, right? But what I have learned is you can't expect other people to represent your interests. You can yell and you can sit around and wait for them to get to it, but you're not on their, you know, you're not on their list of priorities. Then why would you be? You know, so I, I, I just, and this is the thing about starting your own organizations. I mean, nobody, nobody is going to, if I'm going to wait around, for somebody else to put me on their agenda, I'm going to be waiting a long time. So I think we, those communities also have to take some responsibility. I think the transgender uh, uh, community is by forming its own organizations, and now they have seats at the table, and they can say, you know, well, that T, what are you doing about that T? Um, you know, before there wasn't anybody. So, I, I, you know, we have to take some responsibility, I think, for it, and be honest about where we are as a community. I would just add to that, Robin, um, that I think I, I, I think of what is represented here and in this conversation as, as what's hopeful, not just what's absent, that I actually think there's enormous work going on in the bisexual movement, even though there's no paid staffing. Some of the most remarkable work that I've seen is going on there. Trans work, that's completely right. Mm -hmm. Immigration work and the crossover, poverty and queerness. I mean, I, I think that that was part of why I was really also saying that I think that there are like different movements and, and that we need to look differently in different places. Because I think that often the places where some of the most 
amazing and innovative work is happening is not in the places that are the, the most uh, evident as leaders in the queer world or the LG world. It's not the task force at HRC and Victory Fund. It is in places that it's happening really and remarkable work is happening. And it's happening around many of the things that we're identifying as priorities that aren't happening in other places. And that that's the good news. That it isn't as though there's nothing happening and then there's this. It's that the work, I think, at a more grassroots level or a more kind of regional level is often uneven and badly funded and not necessarily tied to the places that are having the most visibility. And so it's very challenging to try and figure out how to move things forward. But if you even look at things like the U.S. Social Forum, I mean, there was like 20, 30,000 people there, you know, doing all kinds of work around the country from a very, very different perspective about social change. And queer stuff was deeply embedded in all the ways that that work was going on. It was one of those places. So I think it's also important that we look for the spots that where innovative work is happening, where really different kinds of starting places for a social agenda are being articulated and figure out how to support those in our community so that they're not isolated and so they have a place at the table and we help bring them to those tables. I mean, I was lucky enough to work at the task force. That really has made a difference in who I know. And so who I know then around queer economic justice issues is different because I know people from that movement and having done aging work, same thing. And so we need to share our resources across movements better, I think, so that we help each other have access. Because it's not as though we don't know the people to call. It's not as though we don't have any idea about the tables. It's not. But we need to organize ourselves to actually have capacity, I think, and, and strengthen each other in the different positions we find ourselves, um, rather than only articulate the places where we're left out. Because I actually think there's remarkable work going on across this country, really. We haven't talked about Wisconsin. We haven't talked about the stuff that's going on in the labor movement. I mean, there's just remarkable work, I think, that's happening that's profoundly hopeful to me as a longtime social justice activist. And we need to find more ways to embed ourselves and articulate our agendas in the places where extraordinary work is happening. I'm just so glad you brought up the point, Robin, and and those two <coughs> comments and the whole panel that I saw. So thank you. Um, I was just struck by the I don't know how many of you saw the new Williams Institute report mm -hmm. by Gary Gates yep. about how many LGBT people are there, right. right? Okay, leave aside methodological problems with answering that question, which he tries to tackle and everybody can quibble with, especially Policy. <laughs> and, and I would say trans people. <laughs> yeah, but, but one of the interesting right. things about that, that I just taken at face value, what was interesting was he concludes from extrapolating from a number of surveys that 3.5% of the U.S. population, uh, 3. Point, actually 8% 8%. Is of the U.S. population is LGBT. And, but get this, 1.8% of that 3. Point 8% is but B. 1.7 is, these are the self-identified, right. okay? Self, and 1.7% is L and G, and 0.3% self-identified T. That's right. Now, this is the self-identified. Check this out. If you look at attraction data, how many, peop how many people have experienced attraction, same gender? 11%. Right. 25.6 million Americans. Yeah. If you look, if you look at behavior data, how many people have experienced have this? I don't like to say Jimmy Hendrix. Are you experienced? Right. <laughs> 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 we all don't do drugs anymore. It's like our experience right. becomes a sexual thing. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> yeah. Eight eight point four percent. Yes. So and then self identification goes down. Now that's like right there a pattern of yep. sex phobia. 
homophobia, denial mm -hmm. of gender, mm -hmm. expression, all in there, yep. unpacking just those three data points. And when I read it, I thought, how fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's okay. So um, really, you know, 25% of the, 25 million people are bisexual in their attraction. Right. And we don't I think even we should talk use the 11% number for the B movie. But I think, you know, I mean, Robin and I have had this conversation, bisexual, the word for trans folks in the community some, it seems very limiting. I mean, I think the other place that there is no conversation is what, are peop what about people who are primarily attracted to trans people? There's no word. There's no community. You know, and, and we've seen cases where people who are primarily attracted to trans people who are not trans themselves have been labeled something when they're not, whether that's gay or straight or bi or queer or whatever it might be, um, and there are folks that are primarily attracted to trans people, and there's no language or community for them. There's some really awful words that they get called sometimes. Um, and so, you know, it's also trying to fit, again, you know, I think of it as that where I have two boxes and I'm trying to smash people into them, or they're being smashed into them, and it's both, you know, about sexuality and gender. And that, those are the choices that that unfortunately we have at the moment. And, and right now we're trying to create a world that just gets us to the, 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 the same level that supposedly everyone else is at. And then maybe we can exceed that. I don't want to be like everyone else. <laughs> I miss our fabulousness. Yes, but I just true. want to answer your question about what are the things that we can do. Um, you know, there, there are some real concrete things that we can do, and the examples that come to mind are, again, ones that have come from the other direction, right? So MALDEF did a, an amicus brief in Prop 8 um, because they saw the connection. MALDEF? Uh, Mexican-American legal. It's, it's, our, um, it's our Lambda legal. It's a Latino Lambda legal. Um, the... Um, National Institute, oh, I'm on the board, National Institute for Latina Reproductive Health, they have a whole program going for lesbians and for immigrant women. You know, that is, is that happening in <coughs> other reproductive, you know, justice organizations that they are looking at lesbians and, um, and the issues that are particular to Latinas? I don't think so. Um, so there, there are, I think, we, I think what it's going to take is whether we change the way we think. Like, where's the empathy in the gay community that you can't look at other people and look at other issues and recognize them as your own? Um, so, you know, I, and if you can't do that, then at least be smart. Latinos are the largest population, the largest minority population, and also the youngest. And that means that they're going to be voting soon, and, you know, white people are going to be dying, and, you know, we can either, <laughs> we can either, you know, have, have, I mean, my, my dream. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not, it's not. No, my, my dream is that, I mean, think of the, the, <laughs> Think of the possibilities or the opportunity for the for the LGBT community and the Latino community to create something, to create a special relationship like the African American and the Jewish community did. Well, yes, but I think they still have that same relation, a special relationship. I mean, we could we could do that, you know. And so, if we don't have any empathy, then maybe be smart. You know, we aren't getting anything by ourselves. I'm sorry, we're not. There aren't as many of us as there are Latinos, you know? And, and as Latinos, we need you too. So change how you think and be smart. <laughs> but you know, there's also, a, a, just to say one other thing with this that I think is really, I mean, I'm loving all of this conversation. And I think that there's um, another generation of movement activists that I don't represent where things look really different around many of these issues. And, and therefore, it really does make me hopeful in very different ways, where the leadership is, ex is absolutely assumed to be embedded in different communities with different kinds of understandings about gender, about race, about class. I mean, I think that there really is a generational break 
that's very different um, around many of the issues that we're talking about here. And that that's going to help us generate a movement that also, again, is another place where the work will be done differently because it's circum because it's it's being understood differently than than where I think some of us that have come from earlier moments in activism have seen issues framed and limited in certain ways. And so I don't think it's all perfect. I don't mean that, but I also think that there's a different kind of time where I see assumptions being different uh, generationally in different parts of the movement. Um, what I could use is called hard cash. <laughs> take checks, MasterCard, Visa. Uh, I, have a, I have one of my steering committee members here. She'll take your check too. Um, I think if you want to help trans folks, is one is uh, don't speak for us, speak with us. I can't, uh, I can't tell you how cranky it makes me um, to have that happen. Um, we are not a monolith like any other community. We have homophobia and biphobia within the trans community. I mean, I think a lot of my early work and MTPC's early work was um, just trying to address those issues. I, I mean, there were trans folks that wouldn't join us because we were headed by a queer, queer group of folks, and and trans folks and folks in the cross-dressing community were like really repelled by that because they also had felt burnt too, I think. Um, I think letting us tell our own stories um, and being our own advocates is, is one thing and supporting, and supporting the work that we do. Um, we, you know, I'll plug my project. We have a project called I Am Trans People Speak and I'll leave these cards out and their video stories and written stories about trans people's experiences and friends and family and partners, and Marsha Garber, who's up in the back, is on that video. Uh, she's a story of her family. Um, and I will honestly say that parents have been huge for us. Parents talking about their experiences of their families. And, and recognizing and acknowledge, acknowledging trans people have families. I mean, I think that when we talk about, we talk about LGB or lesbian and gay families, but we don't ever say trans families. And so we've started shifting our message to say trans youth, adults, and families because we have all kinds of family relationships as well. Um, and, you know, most of the stories we know about trans people are, oh, it's the person who transitioned, and they're all alone, and nobody cares about them and all that, and that's not the reality. Um, and so uh, I think, and if you're not from this area, you know, figuring out who, who is doing trans organizing work and support them in any way you can, whether that's donations, showing up at their lobby days or their rallies or whatever it might be, but being an ally in that way, writing a letter to the editor, um, getting on board with John Stewart's Tomageddon with the whole J. Crew thing, which I think is hilarious. Um, <laughs> look it up. Yeah, so I think that's really what it comes down to. And question organizations that don't have, either don't have trans work happening or don't have trans people involved. I want to sort of build on that by saying that I think policy change is great, but there's, you know, I'm legally married in a same-sex relationship here in Massachusetts. That doesn't mean I still don't ex experience discrimination on the ground. Part of grassroots organizing is reaching out to the people. It's, it's giving money to organizations. It's going to lobby day. It's, you know, being an activist. It's going to rallies. It's also talking to the people in your family. It's talking to the people that you are at work with, you know, and, and not standing for things like homophobia, not standing for things like transphobia or racism. You know, it's the sort of like everyday work of an activist is right next to you. And, you know, it's, it's not just policy change. And all of these things are interrelated. You have to go to the people in power and say you're doing a bad job. Then you have to go to your neighbor and say, you know, I see that you're supporting this racist, homophobic jerk. Can we have a conversation about that? That person wants to take my rights away. It's like making it personal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, talk about your the hate kind of building as a woman on you. talk about one of your biggest allies being immigrants. Now, given the industrial complex, criminalization of people of color, immigrants, large and house people, you would all think that's problematic to have another bill that's going to target these people. Um, so the bill is two. It's uh, non-discrimination, so employment, housing, public accommodations, credit, and then amending the hate crimes. And I know this has been a conversation um, in our group and with other groups. One um, is that if we look at crimes against trans people, majority of them are not prosecuted. 
Um, we have had 11 murders in Massachusetts that we know of, and only two have had prosecution. And one of the person, I mean, one person got two years yeah. for killing someone. Um, I look at it as like, oh my God, someone might, might actually get a murder charge. Um, and the same thing happens when people murder immigrants. Right, and then and and, the and I will say that the trans people are not they're not they're the same. That some of our folks are trans women of color who are immigrants. Mm -hmm. You know, they're often the ones. So I think there is also a, another piece of our work is is how do we do prison activism as well? And part of that, um, I think one of the conversations we have is what do we do when when we get to where we're in the same category? It'll for us it helps people get restraining orders. So a lot of our folks are dealing with the hate crimes part would help someone get a restraining order because we have people who have their windows smashed out because they're trans, and the, the cops say there's nothing I can do about that. Um, get data collection. We don't even know how many trans people are experiencing violence because the police only pick male or female and they put you in the box they think you are. Um, right now the FBI is like the only one that's doing it and they've only doing it since the, that hate crimes bill passed. And I'm not saying it's not problematic because I totally think it's problematic, but it's a platform for us to be able to get in the door and then I think it takes you know, a lot of other folks to turn around and say, okay, how do we change this? Um, We've had a lot of conversations, and it's been really difficult. Um, I think we've also had a lot of conversations about trans folks in prison and access to sex reassignment surgery. And that is, you know, there are people in our community that have mixed reactions around that. Um, and so it's complicated. Um, so we chose to move forward to amend the hate crimes bill because we, we knew that the other benefits from it were going to help folks, particularly our low-income folks, particularly the ones that we're dealing with, the violence from friends, family, neighbors. Um, and really push police and criminal justice folks to do the right thing and get training and stuff like that. So that, that was what we decided to do. That isn't a collective position. I mean, really, there are lots of us that, that do not agree around hate crimes. Uh, there's a new book out called Queer Injustice, which I think is a really important book, um, and many conversations amongst, um, you know, the Sylvia Rivera Law Project does not endorse hate crime work and is in struggle with the anti-violence project in New York around hate crimes because it has a different kind of impact and conversation that's been really absent. So there's, you know, this is another one of those areas that really need to be engaged precisely because these are not simple in terms of how you make a decision and what your call is when you're dealing with very targeted, very marginal, very, very vulnerable communities of folks who have no voice, and it is really not uh, an easy path to try to figure out. And organizations choose differently around how they're understanding this, like hate, hate crimes, and and with often very common agendas in terms of who they represent. So we probably have time for one last question. We're good. Okay. We can join me in, in uh, thanking our panel here.